Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Deliberate Programming. So this is a series of videos where I watch recordings of myself writing software, and I try to figure out what I could do better or faster or evaluate why I made the mistakes that I did, and also talk you through my thought process of what I was doing when I was writing the code. And so today we're gonna to be talking about uh, my web app, PicoShare. And so the point of PicoShare is it's an easy way to let you share files with other people. So there's there's tools like Imgur and Dropbox and stuff, but they all have limits on what you can upload, how much you can upload. Um, and I really just wanted like a simple way to, to give people direct links. And so I'm not gonna upload a file here, but just I'll, I'll paste some text and then I, I can see, whoops, that actually should show in the browser. But it would let, I can share that with somebody else if this was on actual a public server and they could download that file. And I can see everything here. I can also delete that file. So the thing that I wanted to add to PicoShare and what I recorded in today's video is the ability to support guest links. So the way PicoShare works now is only the owner of the server is able to upload files. Everybody else can download files, but only the owner, only the owner can upload their own files. So what I wanted to do is make it so that you could, as the owner, say, oh, here's some guest links, somebody like people that I trust to not abuse the system. I can give them X number of downloads or maybe just unlimited downloads so that they can also use your server. And so what we're seeing now is it's not finished. It's my progress so far, but it lets you create a new guest link. And I can say like for Jim, um, this link expires in seven days. Jim can upload 200 megs and they can upload three files. And so we see we've got this working. It's Jim can upload, it's got the creation date. Last used date isn't set yet. And we've got the size limit correctly and, and all that good stuff. And I believe this works. Yeah, so I can copy the link and this shows up. So Jim would be able to upload through here without logging in and actually show that this is an incognito browser. So we're not logged in, but we can still upload files. But if we tried to just go in the front door, it would prompt us to log in. So that's, that's guest logins or guest uploads kind of working. And so I'm going to show you how I implemented it or what what partial implementation uh, looks like. So, ooh, that's, that's incorrect too. So I'm gonna pull up, this is the file I want. Okay, so one thing to note, you see this timer here. When you see the timer, that's, you're watching a video playback. That's not me coding live. So when you can see the timer, that's the video playback. When you don't see that timer, that's, me actually live coding, which I'm not going to be doing much of, but we'll play the video. So this is me just getting set up in the environment. I'm, I've got this um, serve dev script just as a, a quick script to get things working. Um, and I'm, I'm loading up in burp. Burp is an HTTP proxy. So it lets me show, it lets me see all the HTTP requests and responses. And so I'm just logging in and this is just getting me started. And one thing I immediately notice is that the environment is a little bit dirty. It's got files that I pasted in from testing something else. And so first thing I do is I kill the server and then I run a script to delete the database. And I'm gonna pause here. So I, this is not an easy thing for me to remember. I also have to remember because it's a SQLite database. And so in addition to the store.db, there can also be like store.db.wal, the write ahead log. If you don't delete everything, you end up in this weird state. And so this is one where I realized that I actually should have a, um, I should have another, whoops. I should have another dev script. And so I actually added that after watching this video, which is just reset database. And that's just the exact same thing, um, but it just makes sure I always delete the database um, makes it really easy for me to remember the command. Okay, so that's the first thing. We've got the environment cleared. So I'm gonna re reload this and now you see there's nothing there. So 
at this point, I don't even really know what I want the, oh, and this is the bug I actually ran into earlier. I noticed that if you paste text, what should happen is the text should appear in the browser because browsers can render text. And instead it was uh, downloading. And so I actually fixed that as well recently. Um, that was a pretty easy fix. I just had to set the content type of the text. So when I upload a, a text file, I just have to declare the content type as text plane. So um, that's now fixed thanks to me rewatching this and noticing something I didn't notice before. But at this point, I'm still trying to figure out what I actually want the, the guest link functionality to look like. And usually when I do things like this, I just kind of start, I start implementing the thing that's most clear to me. And in this case, the thing that was, or the thing that's that's easiest for me to think about. And so in this case, it was implementing the HTML front end. And so this is me in the nav bar adding an entry to the, the nav bar for guest links. Um, the white space there was bothering me a little bit, so I fixed that. And so now I've got this guest link thing that does nothing because it's pointing to something that already exists. So now I'm going to change it to um, just the, the guest links route. And now I have to add a route handler for that. So there's not too much that's super interesting about this. I'm going to speed through this because this is not that fun. So I'm just adding a guest links HTML file that is the server is going to render when you click on the guest links URL. And what I'm doing here is I, I copied from an existing page and then I'm just cutting out the parts of the, the page that I don't need because I've got this base template that has a few fields. So you can see there's, I've got a, a little placeholder for style tags, script tags, custom elements. And that's all populating this base.html template. And then there's the, the content here. And so this is sort of a tedious task. This is one of those things where I was thinking about, can I make this faster? I don't really know of a good way to make this faster. And it's something I I don't generate new pages that often. So I don't know if it is worth the effort. But it is something I'm thinking about of like, can I make this process a little bit faster? And so here I'm, I'm just making like a very basic page to make sure that the route works. So I add a route. This is me adding a route in my uh, Golang routes uh, file. So I'm just saying it handles the guest links route. And then I'm going to have to make, make a new get handler called guest links get. And so then I have that in views. And I just copy one of my existing files. And this is another thing where like it's, it's a lot of copy paste. Not crazy about that. One thing I could do is get better at just memorizing the structure, or maybe have some kind of helper to to generate the, the view renderers, but I don't know. I don't have, there's nothing that really jumps out to me as something I'm obviously getting wrong there. So I, I change it to render template. And this is something, this is a, a thing that baffled me a little bit because I've just added this guest links handler. It, it's just a standard Go HTTP handler and it's rendering the guest links template. But you can see that when I view that route, then instead of seeing the guest links placeholder page that I had just created, so I'm, I'm verifying that guest links points to guest links get, and I'm a little bit confused why it's rendering a different page. And so I'm still checking, trying to figure it out. Because I'm on, you can see I'm on guest links, and the guest links HTML that I created doesn't have this. It just is a, a placeholder that says, uh, like a, I think it was a, just a to do. So why am I seeing this page instead? And so if we, this is me. And so actually the the answer is right here. It, I, I think I've come to this conclusion myself, but it's this section. So I copied this from the index handler. And so the index has special behavior where if it's just the root route and if you're not authenticated, it sends you to a login page. But if you are authenticated, it redirects you to this different HTTP handler. And so I, I blindly copy pasted and I forgot to remove that snippet. And so that is kind of coming back to bite me. And so let's see how long it takes me to realize it. Okay, and there we go, there, I realized it. And now I've got it. So now that 
I've removed that special behavior, it, it does what I want, and it just shows that placeholder text. And so here, I'm, I'm doing a lot of copy pasting as well. And this is the HTML framework I'm using, or the CSS framework I'm using is Bulma. It's a framework that's pretty new to me, but I like it because it's, um, it's pretty minimalist. But I, I definitely don't have the syntax memorized at this point. So I'm, when I want to add form elements, I'm going to my existing form in the app and just copying what I've already used and tweaking it because that's a little bit faster than going back to the Bulma documentation and, and trying to figure everything out. So this is me just kind of going through all that stuff. Um, and again, I think the thing that I could improve here is memorizing the, the Bulma uh, class names just to, to make myself a little bit faster at this kind of task. And again, more copy pasting. So a lot of the things that I'm doing on this page are things that I've done already on the upload page. So I'm just um, copying the stuff from what I had already. So I'm going through this. I can speed through this. Oops. I get a little bit confused here because I, I get confused between uh, why the struct isn't working. Um, so it's a struct that inherits from the, this common prop struct. And the syntax, the VS Code is telling me that the syntax is wrong, and I, I don't know why. And actually, the syntax is wrong, I think, because this has to be, um, I think this has to be common props, colon common props. So we'll see if that is what happens. Oh, no, no, it was, so what was the problem? Oh, I guess this just had to be, oh, right, the colon had to be on this part. OK. Um, but that's a thing I, I, I don't do a lot of like struct inheritance, so that's a thing I forget a lot. OK, so we've got this expiration dropdown working. It works pretty similarly to the expiration for files. But the thing I change is I for guest links, I want a different default. And one thing I to note here is like it is a lot of copy paste. And on one hand, I might be tempted to refactor it so that both the expiration rendering on the file page and on the guest link page are sharing the same logic. I don't really want to do that because they're not they just sort of happen to both have similar behavior, but that's not inherent to um, either property. So I don't want to force them to, to share code when they're not necessarily um, going to always have the same behavior. So they, they are independent. It's redundant. But this this early in development, I can always refactor later if I decide, you know what? Um, like I'm, I'm still at the point where I'm, I'm kind of sketching things out. So at this point, I don't try to refactor and share code. I'm just going to do like the simplest thing. And then if I decide later, hey, that actually does make sense, they should share code, I can do that. But at this point, I'm just going to copy paste and let it be redundant. And so the change I'm making here is the expiration options have one of these is a default option that shows on the page. And so for this is a good example of like how they behave differently. So for a file, I, I have Pico share set the default expiration to 30 days. But for a guest length, the default expiration is never. So uh, I just made that change. And now I'm going to make sure that works. Oh, I guess I'm looking at Bulma more. OK, so I'm, I'm pasting a new element into the page. And here, I believe I make a mistake in pasting. We'll see if that's now. Yeah, so do you see here how this I saved, and now suddenly all of this is duplicated. So style tags got repeated, script tags got repeated, custom elements got repeated. So there's a bug there. Whoops. And that's actually a bug in the prettier plugin I'm using for VS Code. There's a, a Go plugin for 
Or there's a, a prettier plugin for Go HTML templates that is really nice, but it's got this bug where if you have invalid HTML, which I'm, I'm suspecting that's what happened, that I um, pasted something in incorrectly. And it, whoops, sorry, I got a call. I think I pasted something in incorrectly and generated like a, an unclosed HTML tag. And so that's the problem. Um, but that's still a bug in prettier. And so I, my policy with open source tools is to start not by complaining about the bug, but to ask to donate. So that's what I did here. My first bug was just to say, like, this is a great tool. I've gotten a lot of value out of it. Bef before I start complaining, I just want to see if I can pay money for the value I've already gotten. Um, and unfortunately, this, this person had actually heard of me, I think, which is kind of neat. But they have uh, tax complications with accepting financial do donations. So it's, it's not so simple for me to to give this maintain or something. But got this bug, and I needed to not have everything get duplicated. And so what I did here was I opened just a scratch file where I can put in the, the thing that I was trying to paste. And so my strategy was to just paste everything in this temporary scratch file until I, I saw the behavior stop. So it's still happening, means which means I am, still have some broken HTML someplace. So I copy this out. Still got some broken HTML. I don't know, wonder if we can see it. Yeah, I think it's at this point we can see there's this is closed twice. So that's why it's complaining. But anyway, I didn't realize that at the time. Oops. Sorry, I'm still getting used to. Well, my cursor is gone. <laughs> I'm still getting used to this uh, Zoom tool. Oh, there we go. Now I got my cursor back. OK, so at this point, I've got, I can now save again without the, the page um, going a little bonk, a bit bonkers. And so at this point, I can go back here, grab the thing I was trying to paste. That goes in cleanly. Grab this thing. That also goes in cleanly. So now I know that was OK. So I, I figured out, I identified the, the source of the invalid HTML, and I was able to get around that bug in the prettier plugin. And so this is me just kind of tweaking the, the guest link creation form. This is taking a while, too. Um, it's mostly just me getting familiar with Bulma um, and figuring out like what's a good way to implement this stuff. You can see here, it's not so pretty. And I'm just kind of going through, just, just trying to get like a basic implementation working. And so the, the next thing I add is uh, upload limit in size, then an upload limit in count. And I'm trying to figure out if there's like a better way of showing that. Because I want I want some way to hint to the user that one is in megabytes and the other is in files. And so I think I. I think I find that in a few moments. Yeah, Bulma has support for that. So, oops. Let's see if I can catch it. OK, so Bulma has support for that. It's not rendering properly, but you see, um, there we go. Now I've got it rendering, but now it's uh, rendering on the same line as its label, which is not quite right. And so at that point, it's it's not such a big deal. That's That's closer to what I want, and so I'm now adding the submit buttons. And so at this point, I'm just trying to get like a basic functionality so I can start testing this. OK, we can oops, kind of breeze through this. And here I'm just changing around the route names because I originally had, I originally had been thinking that guest links was going to be the route for creating a new guest link. I realized that it actually makes more sense. It fits the, the REST model a little bit better if guest links is showing the index of all guest links, and then guest links new is where you would create a new guest link. And so I do that, and this isn't hooked up to anything yet, so nothing happens when I do that. And so the next thing I want to do is, what am I doing here? Oh, just changing file names around a little bit. So now I'm, I'm just adding a guest link. So I've got this um, new guest link and guest link index. I don't like that they're so far apart alphabetically. So I, in a few minutes, I think I rename them so that they are 
alphabetically adjacent. But here I'm just copying a similar index file I already had for the index of files, and I just it's a table, and so I'm just changing it to be a table of the guest lengths. And then I'm just adding, here's a mistake I make. I sort of forget how relative links work in HTML. So what I actually wanted is just, uh, it should have been href equals new, not dot slash, because dot slash is for the, the file system on Linux, uh, but that's not for HTML. So that was sort of a silly mistake, but I realized that pretty quickly. And then here's the thing I do that's also a thing I, I find effective is um, I know I'm going to define this guest link in a in a shared package that everything has access to. But for now, I'm just defining it in a struct on the page that's going to render all of the guest links. And so that will let me just very quickly iterate and think about what, what things I need in the struct. And then when I when the time comes to have this, this official shared definition, I can just move that. But this lets me get, get up and running really quickly without thinking about like what, what the final struct has to look like. And then I get a crash here, and I think it takes me a little too long to figure out what this crash is. So I, I go over to the server process, and I see that there's a crash. And the crash is format file size is not defined. And so somewhere in the, in the HTML template, I had this function format file size and I haven't defined it in the, the Go uh, backing code. And so the thing I screw up here is instead of like taking a second to read and think about what the error message is, I do this, this pattern that I have, uh, well, I guess it's a, a pattern, an anti-pattern I follow, which is I just, instead of like reading the error message carefully, I just go and look at the file it's talking about and look for something or around the area it's talking about. Um, but here, like we can kind of figure out from the, the error message what's going on because file index.html format file size is not defined. So the problem here, file index.html, file index isn't the, the file that we added. File index is the old file and format file size should have been there already. Um, so it's, there's something wrong with the fact that it's referring to file index when we try to look at the, the list of guest links um, because it's missing this format file size function. So instead of, instead of doing that, I just kind of blindly start looking around at things. And I think what I do is write new formatting functions. So actually maybe this requires some explanation. So in Go HTML templates, these are you can custom write custom functions to act in your template. And so let's see. I can show you what those look like. This is me live coding. And so so this is an example of like a, a function that I'm writing for this view handler. So I've got, well, actually might as well just go to guest link. So this is the, the guest links. And so these, these custom functions are available for the template file. So you can see in here, I've got format size limit. And if we look at guest link index, you can see I'm using that function. So it will take a, a pointer to guest upload size limit, which is just an in64 that I've re, retyped and it gives back a string. So that's that's a handy thing to do in Go HTML templates. And so that's that's the issue here. So it's saying that this custom function is not available. Um, and so why is that not available? And so really the issue is here that the template I want is guest links, but instead of referring to guest links, I'm still referring to file link, file index because I copy pasted this. And so let's see how long it takes me to figure that out because I'm not bothering. So instead I'm doing something stupid. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I think 
I guess I'm just looking to see what custom functions are available, what custom functions I've, I've added in that handler. So still taking me a while. Let's speed this up. And again, the issue is this. There we go. Now I got it. Now, OK, so now that I've had the guest link index, and then I realized that I made that mistake where I was using relative links that don't actually work. So I changed that to guest links new. And now this works. Now, So now I can go from the guest links index to create guest link. And we've got this working. So the next thing I, I'm trying to figure out is, I went a little too far. Um, let's see if I can get back to this. So now we're back to Bulma. Now that we've got the pages rendering, I'm trying to figure out how to get this, the labels appearing in the right place. So this is me fixing the thing again. That works. Sorry, we're, we're rerunning a little bit. So I'm trying to fix this. So the label should be above like this, but instead it's appearing next to it, which doesn't make any sense. And I believe I'm using Bulma in the correct way. So I'm trying to figure out what's going wrong there. And so I, I just Google um, the, the class I'm using has, has add-on. And I'm seeing a bunch of other people report the same issue. And so this guy reports that there's a, a fix where he uses the control class. And other people, like, this is a good thing to look for. If you see a lot of people thumbs upping it, that's usually the solution. So a lot of people are thumbs upping it. I decided to, to try it. And I'm going to slow down this part. So I'm putting this in. I'm putting in the solution this guy recommended. And you'll notice that I'm getting a regression of that prettier bug where it now it's doubling parts of the template. So it, it doubled this thing. So I know my HTML is incorrect. And I'm sort of blindly typed this, but I'm remembering that like you can't just you can't wrap a, a div with a, a P tag. Um, P's don't contain divs. And so I, I suspect that's what's going wrong. And so I think I just try making it a div instead. What do I do? I think I'm staring at this for a while. Oh, here it was paused. Oh, and then here I've I've learned from my mistake. Um, so instead of trying to to balance HTML and then try to like accidentally introduce unclosed tags or something, I'm using Emmet. So what you see here is, uh, and I'm. It's, it's been a while since I've used Emmet, so I'm forgetting how to do it. But you can do you can highlight text and then use Emmet wrap. Um, and I type in p.control, and that generates the wrapping tag p, p equal class equals control. So I've actually got a, I can show you the shortcut for that. Oops. Uh, where's my shortcut? Shortcuts. Um, yeah, balance out and then, uh, so wrap. So we can, sh can show you what that looks like. I go MO and that, uh, balances out Oops, in, oh yeah, M in, M I. So I do that and then I do uh, control M control W and then I can say div dot whatever and it would wrap it. But I'm not going to do that now. I'm just showing you. But if you haven't used Emmet, that's a cool feature. And I, I do recommend that keyboard shortcut so you can access that quickly. But I, I don't do it frequently enough, so I, I forget how to use it. OK, so I wrap it, and the fix works. Um, so just as long as you don't use P if you use a div instead. Um, somebody actually discovered that before me, but I didn't see it because they didn't post a complete example. So I decide I should post a complete example. Um, so I spend a few minutes here. So this is me just 
showing my solution. Um, and I try to make it a little bit more complete. And one thing you'll see here, I, I actually screwed this up because there was a second bug in the sample code. And I'm just making sure like whenever I, I correct somebody online, I wanna make sure I'm not giving wrong thing, wrong advice. And so this very unambiguously, I don't, I don't know whether I trust w3docs.com super well, but it confirmed what I suspected. So take that. And so I'm just telling him, but you'll notice here it's subtle, but the, the code highlighting is not correct, which suggests that there's a problem. And it took me a while to figure it out, but there was a stray, oops, a stray uh, forward slash here that there shouldn't have been. So that was screwing up the HTML syntax. I didn't see it in my own code because I didn't copy that part of it, but I iterate on this a few times trying to figure out why the code hiding, like, highlighting isn't correct. First, I suspect it's because I'm just using the placeholder dots. Um, so I think I spend about five minutes just on getting that, responding to that solution, which I don't know if that was the best use of my time. I hopefully it's useful for other people. Okay, and so I've, I've applied the fixes, everything looked good, cool. And so next, this, the code isn't actually hooked up to anything. So it's just HTML, there's no JavaScript. So I can't actually, the, the submit button doesn't actually do anything. I don't know what I'm looking for here, but what I actually have to do is, what am I doing? Oh, I'm just uh, giving IDs to everything so that when I do attach JavaScript, I, I have IDs to attach. So you see what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new um, JavaScript backing for that HTML file. And so to start, I know that I just need to get access to um, the elements. And maybe it's worth calling out here that I'm, it's all just vanilla JavaScript. I'm not pulling in any frameworks. There's no Vue or Angular or React. It's just uh, ECMAScript 6, um, which is, I'm, I'm really liking the style recently of just plain Golang with no framework and then plain HTML with no framework. It's a little bit tedious at first just to hook up the code because um, I think that's a thing that the frameworks do well is hook up your HTML to your JavaScript. But once you get once you get the everything hooked up, it's very simple and it's it's much easier to reason about than I found in a lot of the frameworks. So we continue here, and I'm just going through. So the thing I'm here going through here is just trying to get like a basic confirmation that I've correctly hooked up my JavaScript to the front end. So I do this. I'm just putting in a console.log to make sure that it works. And oops, I can see that it did. I'm going to slow this down. So you're seeing that like when I click create, you see the console.log show up and say that I click create. So that's all working. And from there, I can start adding more complicated behavior. So here, I'm just going through the other elements that I know I'm going to need. This feels very slow, too, just going from one file to another and copying the IDs. I, I don't know a good solution that would make this faster. Maybe if I had them side by side, that would be a little bit faster. But um, yeah, so I spent maybe a minute on that. And then I'm just thinking about what I want to do next. So the first thing I want to do is um, convert all the, the field values in the form to uh, JSON payload. And so it's been so long since I, I actually kind of forgot how I get the value out of a text field. I thought it was dot value, but that seemed wrong to me. But I just said label and dot value. Got a few different fields. Um, so I'm just grabbing the value from each of those. Um, size up a limit. So we're just grabbing these. And then I want to make sure that when I do that, I'm getting the payload that I expect. And so I am, I'm seeing the expiration time, um, label is empty. And then here I, I come up against this, this bug that confuses me for a while. So there, the expiration time in PicoShare is the Sentinel value, which I set to January 1st in the year 3000. But in here, we're seeing that the, the value is coming up as December 31st, 2099. 
And it sort of seems like a time zone issue because like maybe it's, I, I was in Eastern time when I was testing this, but we're, it's still saying that this is in UTC time. So that's where, what the Z suffix means. So that confused me. I'm trying to figure out what that is, but it's not a, it's not a big enough issue that I need to stop. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. I see that it's in the HTML as well. Uh, I'm looking around and trying to figure out, but it's, it's in the, so it's, I'm trying to figure out if it's like, is it just a JavaScript bug? Is it something happening on the server side as well? But what's interesting is that even though it's not the year 3000, which the server expects, the server is treating it as if it's the never expire date. So you can see here, this is the, the never expire date, which is January, the year 3000. And so if you're, if you've got a sharp eye, the issue is actually here. So this is the date. And instead of January 1st, I set to January zero. And apparently Golang treats January 0, 3000 as December 31st, 2099. So it, it actually was all working. It's just, it wasn't the date that I expected. And I, I debated whether to, to do like a whole database migration so that it would fix old instances of 2099 and make them January 1st, 3000. But you know, the, the two dates don't, it doesn't really matter. Like I could just set this date to the expiration time to 2099 January or December 31st. And then that's the Sentinel value. That's actually what I ended up doing because it, it doesn't really have to be the year 3000 for any particular reason. I just arbit arbitrarily chose that. But this confused me for a while. Um, I, didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time I was doing this. I had to, so what I do, do here is I commit what I have, just make sure I'm not causing it with any of my changes. Um, this is a stupid thing I, I do is um, it, it, my pre-commit hooks failed because I had console.log, which I don't allow in my pre-commit hooks. But I, and instead of just ignoring the pre-commit hooks, I can do git commit dash n, which commits regardless of uh, pre-commit hook failure. I went and fixed them, which I shouldn't have done because like I was using those for debugging. Um, so that was kind of a dumb thing. And then, yeah, it, it complains about a few things. So I just commit um, and create a draft. I should have done this earlier. I should be, one of the things I also don't do enough of is committing um, at intermediate stages, just so this is my first commit after an hour of work. I should be committing much more when I have like discrete chunks of work done. But I commit that just so I can go back to the, I kind of sped through that. Um, but just I, I can go back to the main branch and make sure that I'm still able to reproduce the behavior, which I am. I see that it's 2099 here too. So I take a break to file a bug on myself and just say never expire is showing up as 2099 instead of 3000. Um, so I do that. And at, at the time I'm still suspecting that it's a time zone issue. So I'm mentioning that I'm doing it in America, New York, but it was just, a dumb mistake where I'm saying January zero. Okay, so now I'm back to the task at hand um, and I'm seeing that it does, the, the labels popping up in the payloads, that's good. The, the size upload limit is popping up and the file upload limit is popping up. So the, the payload from form is working, so that's good. So now I'm ready to send it to the server. So I, I put it to do myself. So I'm not validating any of this. Um, the, the real validation is going to happen on the server side, but I do want to give the, the user in the browser just some hints about what could be going wrong if they're putting in invalid values. So we continue from there. And so the next thing I want to do is send that payload to... And so this is a, a mistake I make a lot too is or not really a mistake, but it's just kind of a waste of time. I don't have the semantics for JavaScript's fetch API memorized. So I'm always like going to another example of it and copy pasting it. The fetch semantics aren't that complicated. So I could just memorize it instead of doing this. Um, but I'm, I'm going to find other examples and just copy pasting and then doing this. I also probably could have better helpers because I'm, I'm repeating a lot of te text here. So there's probably a better way of doing that where I'm not repeating so much JavaScript for just the, the simple controllers. So I pull in this new controller that I did so that it, I can send it to the server. And we're seeing that the, we're getting a 404 on the server, which I think is expected. 
because I haven't implemented the server side of it yet. Yeah, so that's expected. I don't have a server side handler yet. And so next thing to do is to just implement that. And so to start, I'm just going to give back a status not implemented to make sure I'm talking to the right handler because I, I had issues in the past with. And we see that it is, the error got is not implemented. So that's good. So from here, we can start implementing the handler. And one of the things I did here is I knew that there was a similar handler I had written before because there's a, this very consistent pattern here where we're taking a JSON payload from the user and it has multiple fields and we want to validate all the fields. And so the, the pattern I follow here is something I got from a blog, a blog post called uh, parse don't validate, which I really like this blog post. It's about Haskell, but I have applied this to Golang as well. It probably gives you a little bit, little bit more power in Haskell. But the, the idea of it is that if you use types to represent work in progress, so like when you've got like an int, that could have come from anywhere. But if you could define a custom type um, around an int, so that's something I've done. So let's say, let's go to the types. So get, guess like ID, um, it's really just a string, but once I've, because I've cast it, or I've, I've given a, a type to it, I know that any guest link ID I see in my code has to have passed a trust boundary. I have to have parsed it um, from, from the raw string that I get from the user into this guest link ID. And Golang's compiler will help me if I am treating any raw string as a guest link ID, it won't compile because uh, Golang will say, no, that you're expecting a guest link ID. That's just an unparsed string. And this is a good way of making sure you're, you're always um, parsing and sanitizing whatever you need to do to user input. And you're keeping track in a compiler enforced way of like what's been parsed and what hasn't been. And so I know I've, I've done that exact same thing before. So I did it in my other project, What Got Done, which is a task journaling app. And so I know I've got like kind of a good boilerplate for that. And so I'm just looking for a, there's this preferences from request where I'm doing basically the same thing. The user submits their preferences. I parse um, each part of it into uh, a specific type, and then I get back the, the whole type. And so this is what I'm doing here. I'm just saying, so instead of types.preferences, it's going to be a types.guestLink. And remember this dummy guestLink struct that I created before. Now it's, it's this struct's time to shine. I'm going to use this as the starting point for this struct. And I'm realizing also that like label, so just like I want to have um, guest link as a whole parse thing, um, label and expiration time is already uh, its own type. But label, I don't want it to be just a raw string because then I won't know if I've actually explicitly parsed it or not. So I'm going to define a type for that, guest link label. And then I'm going and looking for what are the other things that I want to be part of the struct upload size remaining, which is UN64. And then same thing. I don't want it to just be, I want to make sure I'm defining custom types for these. Cool. So I've got that done. And now this is just kind of grunt work of making sure I'm adding explicit parsers for each field and then um, wrapping that up in guest link from request. So the, the request is just taking the HTTP request and making sure I, I parse everything out of it correctly. There's not much that's super interesting here. Let's keep going on. I'm just adding parsers for each thing, which is a little bit boring. Let's skip ahead. Um, and here I'm being a little bit lazy. Like I'm not, I'm just kind of trying to get the structure of the parsers. I don't really care yet how I'm, I'm Normally, I would think through like, okay, what are the ways that a user could submit malicious data? In this case, it's the it's the owner of the server is the only person who accesses this interface. So you don't have to be we don't have to be super aggressive about defending against um, malicious inputs here. It's still good to to just make sure the server the the user can't do anything that's gonna break their server. But um, we don't have to be we don't have to to go nuts with figuring out every possible malicious input. 
So I'm just going through, I've got the, the parser for the label, then I want to parse the expiration, which I've already done for, that's a, an instance where I can share code because I already have something that parses expiration time values. Um, but I just had to refactor a little bit so I can share the code. Um, then we're making a parser for the size limit and the upload limit. I'm just gonna spree, speed through this because there's not too much here that's super interesting. Keep going through here. And again, I'm, I'm debating what, how rigorously. Um, oh, here I realized that what I actually want is for the, the size limit to be optional um, because it, maybe I could have treated zero as optional, but instead I made it so that it, the, these values could be null. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know if, could I do it with zero? Um, no, because I want I want the value to represent unlimited. So I, and it's I'm I'm kind of using it as a count. So like as the, what I have in mind is like as you de as you use this guest link, um, it's gonna dec like when you create it, it's gonna be like five. But as users use the link, it will decrement from their total. So it couldn't be zero because that would be indistinguishable from uh, an exhausted link that's used all its quota. So these do have to be pointers so that they can be nullable. So I change this to um, the struct have pointers, and then I have to adjust how I'm doing these. So when you, at creation time, the the payload can be zero, and that can represent um, an uns unspecified number, or the payload can just be what do I what do I set it to, or just like a blank a, an empty string. Um, and so here I'm just Printing out the raw request. Yeah, printing out the raw request helped me debug. Oh, and I'm just trying to figure out like uh, whether I can, how to represent empty values to um, the Go JSON parser. Because I'm realizing, I think this, yeah, you can't use a pointer in the go JSON parser. I'm trying to remember like, so the issues here, I'm saying in my, the struct from the user, these are optional. Um, maybe there is a better way. Like I think there actually is type annotations to say optional, but the solution I ended up going with is that the client can pass, I believe that the solution was that the client can pass zero or empty string to represent unlimited. Oh, and this was a, another silly, silly mistake I made. Because the Bulma documentation said that the only supported types were text and like a few others, I, I chose the input type as text, but I knew that it should just be number. Um, I don't know why I, I let the, let me see if I can blame Bulma for this. Yeah, so the following type attributes are supported, text, password, email, tell. I don't know why it's saying that because you can do number and it formats it just fine. Um, but I, I got hornswoggled by this incorrect documentation and I used text when I knew it was a number. But when you say text, it um, JavaScript treats the, the value as, uh, as text instead of, is that true? I think it treats it as text instead of a number. Um, but you also can, can set mins and maxes. Um, we're still having this problem. So what do I do to solve this? Where the, the JSON parser on the server side has to be able to take optional fields. So I think I, right. So I'm still trying to figure out like what the problem is. Um, cannot, cannot unmarshal string into go struct field preferences dot size of size limit of type int. Um, size limit of type int. Oh, I don't know why it's saying it's size limit of type int because it's a pointer to an int. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so I think I realized that this has to not be pointers, but just, oh, is that what I, is that the solution? 
um, that I make it a value or null. Oh, I guess that was the solution. So I guess you can have nullable types in the JSON payload. I, I wrote this a week ago, so I I'm, I'm apologize. I'm kind of forgetting what I did. Yeah, so I changed it so that if there's no value, it sends null. Um, I realized there's actually a better solution for this. Um, so I was par doing parsint. And OK, so, so scratch that. It, it still is text, even if you set the value to, or even if you set the type to number. Um, or actually, I don't know about that either, because it, I might be doing this because it's, um, I'm not sure. But in any case, I, I found a better solution than than doing parsent. Oops. Is uh, this thing that I don't see very often is value as number. Um, so you can do value as number will give you the value in, of the input field as a number instead of as text. So that's a handy thing to keep around. So now at this point, I believe I've got everything working. Um, so it's I don't have this handler finished yet, but I'm I'm verifying that I can see all this coming. So it does seem to be coming to the server in the expected format. There are certain fields that I'm not populating yet. So, but the expires thing is there. Uh, upload size remaining is a pointer. Upload count remaining is nil because I didn't set anything. Um, and this one, I realized actually there's a better solution for this. So because I am renaming the so expires is just uh, a custom type alias for time dot time. So if I was using time dot time, it would render in a pretty way like this. But because I'm using a custom type, it doesn't. And I realized there is a better solution for that, which is. In types, I, I just create a custom formatter for, I add a, a string function or string method to ex expiration time. And I just um, cast it back to a time dot time and pass it the, to the string function for that. And so doing it that way, I do actually get better rendering. OK, and then we got left. OK, and then I've got to add a parser for upload count limit because I had only done size limit. I'm going to go through that. And then what, what's, what do I have left? Yeah, this is, this is just kind of like grunt work connecting things together. Um, I'm going into, actually, that's a little bit interesting. I'm going into my store interface. So once I have data on the store server side, I have to put it into the data store. So I'm adding an entry to the my data store for inserting a guest link, um, so just so I can plug in the HTTP handler to the backend data store. And then it's I'm doing everything in SQLite. So I'm just adding a, at this point, I'm just adding like a dummy implementation. Um, I'm not actually doing the SQLite insertion yet. I'm just putting in dummy like in memory implementations before I get to the point of, so this is like kind of a nice, um, like in progress thing to do, just add like an in memory implementation, it's much easier than writing all the SQL. And so when I get it, it just returns the inner array. And then when I insert it, it's just going to add something to the array. So I don't have to go and actually like write proper SQL code for inserting and selecting something out of the SQLite database. And because I just want to see if, if this works, if I can add something and then see it render on the page. So this is more just connecting things. Let's get to me actually adding a a guest link and then seeing it render. And so you can see what happened here. Uh, so, so according to this, this did save it. It put it in the in, in memory implementation. Uh, but oh, but it's not it's not redirecting me properly. And it's not showing up here. So why is that? So now I'm trying to figure out why it's just not showing up. Because I think I did have, oh, OK. I, 
so even though I, I had something putting something into the store, I didn't have on the the guest link index, my my table of guest links, I was missing this thing that actually retrieved uh, information from the data store. I was just implementing the, the dummy empty one before. So now I'm pulling stuff from the data store. Um, again, it's just in memory right now. Um, it was using this dummy implementation. Now I'm changing it to the real implementation of the guest link struct. And we're just putting, just connecting everything to the HTML front end. And we got it, sort of. Well, we, we have something actually showing up, but here we're seeing the uh, error in the template. Executing content at size limit, can't evaluate field size limit in type types.guestlink. And in the recording, this is another time where I breeze past the error message, don't stop and think about what the error message is telling me and just kind of blindly start hacking away at stuff. Um, but if we take a moment here, executing content at dot size limit, can't evaluate field size limit in types so based on the error message, without looking at anything, I suspect that I, f I have a mismatch between the template. Like I think in the template, I have a field called size limit, but in the actual um, struct that I've defined, I don't have that size limit. And that would make sense because I was using the, the dummy struct, the dummy local struct, and I've switched to the official type. But at this point, I've been coding for two hours straight. I'm not thinking so clearly. I don't think, I, I don't think I'm patient enough so I, I think I'm just going and trying to like add in formatters because as if that will, yeah, that's that wasn't the issue. <laughs> I'm, I'm now just adding a formatter in the hopes that that will do anything. Um, so that's something I do eventually need, but that's not the problem at hand. So I, I add this format size limit. I add, now I'm gonna add a format count limit that's doing a similar thing. And so the, the formatter is just saying like if the, if the value is nil, um, if it's optional, then we treat we treat that as unlimited, um, and otherwise we're just going to uh, create the string representation of the number. So I didn't, I ignoring the error didn't fix it. Just like mucking around with the code, surprisingly did not fix it. So now I have to actually think about it. And I think what what I just saw is maybe me realizing my mistake. Let's see. So I look at, yeah, here. So I'm looking at the definition of the struct and I see that uh, size limit is not the name of this field, it's upload size remaining. And so I think at this point I realize, okay, I have to copy these and now it all works. Now it shows up as size limit unlimited, count limit unlimited. So that worked. Um, that was with, with null values for the size limit and upload limit. So let's see if it works, if I actually put in stuff. And it does, I put in 50 and three um, it's 50 bytes instead of megabytes, so I'm missing a conversion someplace. But this is still, that's that's not too hard. Um, that's working. Oops. And the expiration also works. I tried setting that. Um, so I'm setting all the fields. Created is still not hooked up anything, so that's not surprising. Um, we're almost done with this recording. Is there anything else I do? Oh, so I, I populate created. And then I give it an ID just to make sure that everything has a unique ID. Um, I want to give guest links better IDs. So the, the download links are, are just like a 10 digit alphanumeric sequence. Um, and I want something similar for the guest links, but just for the sake of expediency, I'm making it like a simple timestamp is the ID for now, just so everything has a unique timestamp or a unique ID. And I added a to do for myself. And so we see here, and I just want to make sure I'm going to inspect the source to see if the ID is actually showing up, and it is. So this is the ID that I've created for this guest link, and it's a, it's a timestamp for now, but I know that everything's connected properly. And I think that's about it. We've got, let's see, we've got five minutes left. What am I doing here? I think this is just me messing around a little bit, seeing what I want to fix in the remaining time, formatting the time. Oh yeah, so that should be last used. Yeah, so at this point I'm thinking it's time to take a break because I've been I've been at it for two hours straight. And I think I'm just playing around with the code at this point. I don't think there's anything else interesting, so I'm gonna wrap up here, um, but that's all. So I've still got some work to do on this guest link stuff. So you can see uh, in the meantime, I've, I've added a little bit. 
I've added the ability to copy it, which you didn't see there. I've uh, added the, the proper conversion, but that's all. So this is me adding a feature in a Golang uh, vanilla JavaScript web app. Um, if you've got any feedback about things that would be you'd like to see in future videos, let me know. Uh, and I hope this was interesting and maybe helpful.